good afternoon everyone i am dr gokul fine layer clinical embryology post graduate at smart it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's panel discussion dr jaydeep tang consultant ashwini maternity and surgical hospital center for endoscopy and f f co-founder co-founder of esperance as healthcare private limited and program director and member of board profit ivf and i would like to invite the okay. i would like to invite the panelists dr vani pujari ma'am director of aksha women's care and fertility center salem past president ogsos and founder president okay welcome you ma'am next dr danapakya ma'am medical director sudha hospital We welcome you, ma'am. Next, Dr. Uma Velmurugan, Managing Director and Chief Consultant, Venus Fertility Center, Tiruchi. We welcome you, ma'am. Next, ma'am, Dr. Nirmala Vijay Kumar, Consultant, Queens Fertility Center, Trinal Valley, Tamil Nadu, Alumni of SRMC Department of Gynecology, 1992 and 2002. We welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Madhubala Manika Vasakam, alumni of Stanley and Ramchandra Medical University, practicing in Ternal Valley at Lakshmi Madhavan Hospital. We welcome you, ma'am. Next, Dr. Asha Rao, ma'am, chairperson of Endometriosis Committee, FOXI, 2022-2022, has experience of 25 years in ART. We welcome you, ma'am. I will request Dr. Jaydeep Tank to Jaydeep Tank to tell us, sir. Thank you. Thanks. So I am unable to see three panelists. So I am going to move there with the mic later, as soon as I finish the introduction. It's already open, isn't it? Yes. One second. Yes, right. Don't worry. No, it's already present. Okay, no problem. So, very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I understand that this panel is between you and the lunch. Uh, maybe that's why they have made the time 20 minutes instead of <laughs> what it was. Can you change that time? So, if you want to know when you will get lunch. Uh, you shouldn't be asking the organizers. You should be looking at the clock over there. Uh, it's fine. It's not displaying this. Oh no, no, I know that this is the first slide. Yes, it's is. fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so again, let me thank the smart team led by Dr. Sanjeev Reddy for organizing this wonderful event, and I am delighted to be conducting this panel on troubleshooting in assisted uh, reproduction. And I have an extremely eminent panel here. And you know, when, whenever I'm asked to moderate a panel, uh, I always wonder how to moderate it. Should I moderate it like someone who's probably had a very difficult forceps and had a low APGAR, or someone who's very biased, someone who thinks he knows it all, or like keep on saying the audience wants to know and not allow the panelists to speak. And uh, then I think it's always a good idea to conduct panels like those two wonderful interviewers. Uh, that's Larry King, probably one of the great TV hosts of all time. And I don't know whether you've seen that. That those are the Frost Nixon interviews, uh, where Nixon confessed to Watergate, uh, actually for the first time, maybe 20 years afterwards. And those interviews have actually become a landmark in how to interview someone on television. Uh, but before I begin, I just have this one instruction for all the panelists uh, to please keep it short. Like Thalapati Vijay says, let me sing a kutti story. So keep your answers also short, just like him. And always, you know, we are troubleshooting, so problems will come and go. Konjam chill pannu maafi. 
<laughs> right. So let's let's begin the panel proper uh, by saying this: that there is only one thing that is truly important in an IVF laboratory, everything, everything. and that is nicely illustrated in this slide over here, where clinician, lab, and then again the clinician comes in after the embryos get transferred. And all these have to work in harmony. And if you see here, it is estimated that there are something like more than 200 variables uh, only in the lab which could influence results. Obviously, when there are so many moving parts, you will have to troubleshoot uh, some of them. So what we'll do is first, we'll address some troubleshooting uh, in clinical scenarios. Then we'll address troubleshooting in procedures and then troubleshooting in the lab itself. So there are only four slides in this presentation. I think that I have such wonderful panelists that I must be the person who speaks the less, uh, least. And so uh, I have made, I have not really made slides uh, quoting studies, etc. And I hope uh, that the panelists will also, uh, rather than quoting studies, speak from their practical experience uh, in this panel. No problem, it's perfectly fine. So Dr. Vani, let me start with you. Uh, troubleshooting in the first instance. How do you troubleshoot when there are discordant markers of ovarian reserve? When the AMH and AFC don't necessarily correlate with each other. And we know that we are increasingly using age, AMH and AFC as uh, the primary markers and you know, we want to prognosticate. We also want to establish starting dose on the basis of this. But there are situations where sometimes you feel uh, that the AFC looks all right, but the AMH has come way low. Or the AMH looks all right, and the AFC is not really as good as it should be. So what do you do in these situations? Yeah, th uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I, I think the first and foremost uh, which will come to our mind is whether the AMH was done correctly or not at least in our country and where uh, everything is outsourced and uh, whether it is done correctly or not. So we can never ever uh, look at AMH alone. Like you already said, we have to look it in the perspective like her age and ovarian volume and uh, so whether there was any ovarian surgeries, whether the, 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 by that way we, will we can decide whether we can give weightage to that uh, low AMH or high AMH value. And um, another thing is, uh, there are there are quite a few studies uh, on this on discardency of uh, AMH and uh, AFC. Uh, even though we used to think that AMH in general represents the uh, the capacity or whatever reserve of the ovary, and AFC will tell us how many follicles we are going to get during that cycle. But still, if even if we have good AFC and if AMH properly done, if it is low, we might not get as expected, the, the number of uh, oocytes we get is quite low. So th those studies clearly prove that if AMH is done correctly, uh, because either it, it, it sort of either upregulates or downregulates the follicular That's growth. Right. Yes. So we either get less or more. So more. in a way, we give more weightage to a, a, uh, AMH. But of course, look it in that Looking at everything. So thank you very much. I'll urge all the other panelists, if they have any other point of view, Please feel free to jump in. Yes, yes sir. Always give importance more of AFC rather than AMH. AFC. Because AMH always uh, give lab variables are there and always gives the wrong thing. Like 0.5 they say they'll get good number of follicles. <laughs> and we have uh, M2s also, we have pregnancy also. So Absolutely. never ever think that less than 2, 1.5 or 1 or 0, nothing happens. You stimulate and see, see the M2, then go for it. Yeah. So AFC is always the best indicator. Okay. So if you have a discordancy, uh, the first thing to understand is that this does occur. It's not uh, completely unheard of. It's not always that the AFC and AMA uh, correlate with each other. In terms of counseling, what you need to tell the patient is that these are all not set in stone. Uh, you still need to undergo a stimulation to fully understand and sometimes the stimulation might surprise you. And in terms of deciding the starting dose, uh, if there is a discordancy, I would personally go more by the AFC uh, rather than the AMH, uh, although the AMH is an important consideration. 
So, Dr. Danabhagi, ma'am, establishing and maintaining a supply chain, it's always quite difficult. Uh, and what with the variable quality of gonadotropins sir, that are available? Sir, this is to ask my pharmacist and my embryologist <laughs> <laughs> this question, sir. But anyhow, when I started, when Jatin used to come from Mumbai, I used to get from uh, hormones from through air and I check the thermometer into the yes. box and see that cold chain is maintained or not. Yes. Then all this uh, ILR, all these things, every day I check, it's less than five or something, every day I have to check. And the com uh, coming to disposables, every time when I receive, the company should always in the box inside, they have to keep the thermometer and they have to show that it's correctly, it's maintained, less than five, five to eight or something. Yeah. And all this uh, medium checking, all this medium also, whenever it comes, I always check whatever the portion you are, your chief head, everything, that is not the matter. You have to, when it comes, no, don't believe embryologists, don't believe your doctors you are appointed, you yourself check. You also then check. only you will get a good results. That always I do, still now. Still now. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's right. always an important thing. We have to look after ourselves. Absolutely. Then other thing is, uh, uh, again, medium. Medium, if it is gone, everything is gone. Yeah. So medium, whichever media they bring, again, check the cold chain is maintained properly and properly you keep the incubator properly, everything, hours before you keep everything. Now every day you check, check, check. This checking is only important now, live IVF laboratories. We have to be very careful about it. So this uh, everything, no, myself still I do. Sure. Dr. Ashara? I think it's very, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's very important to be suspicious and paranoid. Yes. In IVF. <laughs> if you're doing IVF, you have to Don't be Don't believe anyone else. Don't it's believe very, anybody. It's very, very important because during uh, COVID times, uh, you know, for a short while we had stopped IVF. When we restarted, we saw that there was a drop in the results. And then we explored and found out that the media which came from Mumbai, in fact, they were coming to Chennai, uh, getting segregated, and then being sent to smaller towns. So there was a delay in the airport. And because of that, there was a problem with the media. Yes. So this we had to find out, and then we had to talk to the company and avoid that. Uh, similarly, the water in the incubator, once we had changed the company, and there was a problem again, and they realized that this water in the incubator had high metal contents. So, dear friends, be paranoid. Very Be important. paranoid. Okay, great. Actually, they were supposed to, when they ship, they, they, know, they know that within four days it should reach the client. But here they completely ignored that protocol. It was staying somewhere for yeah. weeks together and they were not supposed to because it cannot, the media cannot maintain yes. beyond those many hours. Right. So that was totally uh, sure. cross. Sure. Uh, Whatever, everything you check, whatever it is, the embryologist says, okay, madam, first check is good, and third <laughs> embryos are good, then only our life is coming back again. This is all our, we are all walking on the fire. Yeah. IVF means walking on the fire. Okay, sure, so we have sure. to be very careful in everything. Madam, you want to add something? Uh, no. Okay. Now, let me ask you a troubleshooting question, okay? Uh, you have received a batch of injections. Now, you, obviously, the important thing here is to make sure that you understand your supply chain, understand where it is coming from, how many days it has spent at the airport, how many days in transit. And I cannot emphasize enough how important it is. But madam, suppose you receive a batch of, uh, let's say, medium. Yeah, I'll check always the, no, the manufacture, listen to the question. manufacture date. Yeah. Always. But the These question is like this. dump on the drugs, yeah. less price, this and that, they'll cheat you. Yeah. Don't give that way at so all. So my question is <laughs> that now you have checked the box of medium has come, right? Now you have seen the invoice, you've seen the date of shipping, it's more than four days. And when you open the box, you find that the temperature has not been maintained. What do you do? Send back. Send, send it back. Send back and ask <laughs> that fellow fire like anything. He should, not <laughs> <laughs> he should not do this again to our center. Okay. That, that fellow, what are you bad words? <laughs> what bad words I talk, no, they will yeah. run away from me. <laughs> okay. So next time you have a problem with medium supply, call up madam. <laughs> And she, you can tell her to fire those people for you. Uh, so I think that's, that's, that's also very important. That don't hesitate. If you find that there's something wrong, uh, don't get swayed by uh, the people who are the suppliers. They will say, Array, don't worry, nothing will happen and so on and so forth. But, you know, you don't have to take that at face value. As Dr. Asha Rao said, be paranoid. Uh, Dr. Uma, uh, serological testing in uh, follicular phase. First of all, uh, do you do serological testing in the follicular phase? That's the first question. Secondly, uh, how do you troubleshoot a high progesterone on the day of trigger? And two, do you always find a correlation between the response and E2 levels 
Now let me uh, let me give a caveat here. I don't do serological monitoring at all because I think it sometimes confuses you more than anything else. I am very fond of saying that the first blood test I do in an IVF cycle is beta HCG, 14 days after embryo transfer. Uh, but Dr. Uma, yes. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, I totally agree that I don't do the serological testing of E2 for every single patient. When you suspect that uh, the amount of uh, hormones which you give and if the patient is not responding, then you check the E2 levels and as you say, like, uh, I would go with Madam's, Danavage Madam's uh, view of like, you know, checking again whether your cold chain in your hospital is being maintained. That's one of the things we can blast yes. the person who gives us, but you have to be conscious of what is being done in your own unit. That is one of the things and my girls will definitely get it back from me when it's not being done. And whatever it is, it is you who is going to face the patient, not them. You cannot yeah, blame your staff. Yeah. At the end of the day, it is only one-on-one uh, -on -one to you and all the pressure is on you. So um, that you have to maintain it. And uh, high progesterone on the day of trigger, I think we had a beautiful talk this morning saying that. Just to recap it, when your progesterone level, I mean, I don't routinely check it, but when you suspect there is something not going in the right way, then if your progesterone level is more than 1.5 nanograms, and then we know that that cycle is not going to be very fruitful in terms of implantation. So you have to be careful if you're going to transfer in that cycle. I mean, we got uh, beautiful vitrification techniques now, and so I would go with freezing, um, freeze all in that cycle and then decide about the transfer later on. So all of our OD patients know, most of them rupture the follicle. You see progesterone more than two or four or five. Yeah, yeah. So always we don't get X at all. So you have to be very, very careful. One yeah. follicle you rupture, you see ultrasound, you cancel. Cancel. Don't put yes. into again needle, embryo says no, egg, neck, nothing. Okay. So please cancel it. One follicle rupture also, it's a waste of everything waste for of us. Thing. Yes, Dr. Asha. Yeah. I agree with the Dr. Jaydeep Tan that uh, I mean, I've always heard him say that we do not do uh, blood tests. We want to reduce their agony. It's true, but and I think with the advent of antagonist cycles, we can do less and less tests. But I would definitely like to do the day two, one test. Uh, LH2 has become part of our thinking, you know, uh, and we also started doing progesterone and prolactin. Progesterone sometimes is high and, you know, the corpus luteum that looks tiny sometimes, it could be still active. So the progesterone is high, you do not go ahead with the stimulation. And some patients where they have even done the prolactin earlier, we saw that prolactin could be high in that cycle. Suddenly it is 40-45 and sometimes you see that the follicles uh, get stimulated at a very low pace. In fact, there was a patient who was getting going slow in her stimulation and seven days after uh, stimulation check, the prolactin was about 45. And only after suppressing it, she proceeded further. So I think we can try to reduce the number of tests, but we definitely need to do it. Sir, are we saying uh, even if we're going for uh, fresh transfer, we, do, we won't do a progesterone? Are, you, are we okay, saying that? Okay, uh, I think that's... I don't do it, but I have my reasons no, for no, doing just, it. Just I, I don't think there's enough time for me to elaborate on it. We can talk okay. about it later, but I, I don't do it. Yes, I, I don't do all, progesterone levels. No I have my reasons for not yeah, doing it. Freeze but all, you not do the no need to on do the day all. of trigger, yeah, but yeah. sometimes we do on and off, we do fresh transfers, yes, but which I think progesterone will be important. Yeah, poor sure, responders, no abroad people, yeah. we have to do yeah. fresh transfers. That time you have to check. Okay, let me move on. Dr. Nirmala, trigger troubleshooting for trigger, uh, GnRH agonist for all or HCG for all or dual, if not GnRH or HCG for all, when will you select one over the other? My and standard protocol. One minute, mm -hmm. let me finish the question and, and uh, luteal support in each circumstance. So you have actually three questions, when will you use GnRH, when will you use HCG, when will you use dual and luteal support for each? Uh, my standard protocol is used to, to use uh, HCG 10,000 units for trigger. Okay. But I would go for uh, GnRH agonist if there is a risk of OHSs yeah. in a normal or high Absolutely. responder. And do well, I reserve it for those patients who might have had an empty follicle in the previous cycle or for those patients who have a low LH. And um, yeah. so I reserve my dual trigger of using HCG plus uh, GnRH agonist. And I usually give them at the same time. Uh, I don't maintain a distance between them. Uh, why? Because I find that if I give a GnRH agonist a bit earlier, sometimes the follicles rupture earlier than the speculated 35 hours. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, do Luteal you... 
like when I started doing IVF, I used to be, I'm less paranoid now, I'm still paranoid, but I used to be more paranoid at that time. So for giving HCG 10,000, I used to give 5,000 from one company and 5,000 from another <laughs> company <laughs> because I was always worried. That's the most important injection. Yes, it is, it is. And if it didn't work, it used to. Now I use recombinant HCG, so I don't do that. And because I use recombinant HCG, the equivalent units are 7,500 because I use yeah. a single prefill syringe. So I don't use uh, 10,000, but that's what. Uh, does anybody do that? Still mixing two HCGs and no, giving no. it? No. I think not, we all not used to love that Pregnil, you know. Ever yeah, since Pregnil exactly. disappeared, yeah. I'm very much disappointed with any brand of HCG. And now we are more with the recombinant HCG. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now more and more I'm yeah. leaning towards the uh, GNR analog, two yeah. ampules, three ampules. Three ampules, yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Ovidril, no, that's very good for everybody. They have a good number. Before, we always say urinary uh, HCG, it will give good eggs, this and that. Because people threatened when Ovid, this uh, recombinant uh, trigger came, no? But now everybody using that is giving very good uh, M2s. Yes, no problem. it is. Yeah, no Ovidril. question about that. That Thank is you. equal to 6,500 units of HCG. Yes. One, that's good. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Just yes, uh, one question I wanted to ask is like if exactly. your patient's BMI is high, when you're giving a trigger, would you use a double the dose or anybody, any answers? Agonist or antagonist? Which cycle? HCG, HCG. Yes. When you give HCG or agonist, whatever. Both, for both. But uh, usually more than 30 BMI you don't put, no? Yeah. No, and in any case, I don't think that that enough. makes yes. too much difference, uh, yeah. really I speaking. Don't I don't change the dose, whatever the BMI is. I'm very basic that way. Uh, yes, Dr. Asha. I have one question for you. Yes. Uh, if it is an antagonist cycle and the patient is obese like 100 kilo, uh, will the change of dose of antagonist change? No. Does it make a difference? No, I don't think it does. Uh, I, I was actually part of… Uh, 60 kilos and somebody is 110. Yeah. No, I understand. But uh, I was actually a part of the dose-finding trials in Brussels uh, when the antagonist dose-finding trials were going on. I was uh, studying in Brussels at that time. And there was a lot of discussion on variable doses of antagonists depending on BMI, follicular size, etc. And there are those studies yeah, which those have been published. Agonist, but, cycle, uh, agonist cycle, no use like a yeah, dropping, then, E2 is dropping 10,000, 7,000, 8,000. Yeah. That case, we used to give 4,000 instead of 5,000. Yeah. Like uh, we'll just uh, reduce the amount we used to give to prevent overages. Yeah, but now I think, you know, for at least for antagonist dose, it's quite clear that a fixed dose yeah, works yeah. quite well across uh, the entire spectrum. Uh, yeah, recently yeah. we had a girl who was 106 kilos and we just gave one ampule of citrotide per day and seemed to work fine. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, we see quite a lot of uh, obese patients. I work with a predominantly Gujarati population, so, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Madhubala, uh, freeze all for all. That is, that is the question. I mean, that there has been some uh, discussions on that it would be beneficial to do freeze all for everybody and then do only thaw transfers and if you are doing freeze all for all or even if you are selectively doing a freeze all for all your thaw cycle do you prefer natural or down regulated with hormone replacement uh, freeze all for all uh, we don't follow that's not an universal protocol in our Absolutely. center we yeah. always do fresh transfers when it is possible freeze all for people who are high responders and when there is a progesterone high progesterone level at the trigger and uh, regarding the thaw cycle uh, I, we always use the down relation with hormone replacement because we do in batches and the ovulation synchrony is not similar with all patients. Absolutely. So we have to have our stance, so we down regulate with hormones and then transfer. Yeah, so when freeze all for all started being talked about in literature, it seemed to be very promising. But there were two or three issues with the literature. Uh, again, because of lack of time, I won't go into that, but now it is very clear that freeze all for all is not the right thing. You do a freeze all for selected patients and really speaking, there's hardly any difference between natural cycles and cycles which are down regulated with hormone replacement in terms of results. Dr. Asha Rao. Uh, just to complete, yeah. we started doing some letrozole cycles for uh, FED okay. transfers. Sure. It seemed to do work very well. Yeah. And patients are very happy because they can escape the injections of uh, the down the regulation. Okay. And I think the outcome also seems to be better with less miscarriage rates. Okay. So, Jess, does anybody use injectable progesterone? Do you use injectable progesterone? Yes, we are okay. still using okay. for, uh, I think, 70% of our HRT. Yeah, cycles. people who are very fussy, don't want injections, because still we believe IM is better than anything else. Okay. People uh, fail, don't want injections. Like very fussy patients, we could uh, crinone gel. Okay. Uh, that is, uh, 
Oh, so I will again, 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 again beg to differ. I have not used IM progesteron since 2002. Good. No, I, good. Not a single patient is on IM progesteron Result, since 2002. Results are the same. Results are All the same. my patients are either on gel or didrogesteron or gel sometimes a combination mm -hmm. as the latest study shows. Gel is costly. Uh, See poor people, no? 5,000 like rupees uh, here or there. Anyway, uh, so again these are variations in practice. Yeah, Individualization. Uh, yeah. Dr. Ashara, uh, troubleshooting here for consent. The husband is abroad uh, and, you know, frozen the sample and gone. Uh, now, we always think that it's not a very difficult thing. You freeze the sperm and uh, even if the husband has been abroad for five, six months, you can go ahead and use that sperm. Obviously, medically, it's not a problem, but socially, it's an issue. I've had a patient who came to me and said that, doctor, now my husband has been away for five months. Now, if I get pregnant, people will say the husband is not here. How did you get pregnant? <laughs> and how many people will I explain it to? And medically, although, you know, it is quite all right, uh, that is something which I had actually till that time not thought about. And this patient brought it forward and I realized that this is not really as simple an issue. Uh, what about also the sample from home? A lot of people say that sample has to be collected in the lab. Otherwise, if they bring it from home, you don't know whose sample it is. We never know. And if you sweet. know, how, how do you know that that is the husband's sample and not somebody else's? And what about posthumous use of gametes? So, Dr. Ashara. Uh, the first point you already cleared, that is, is the, it's a lot of psychological issue when husband is away. Yeah. Uh, though you can use it scientifically and also you can take a consent before he leaves. Or you can even get a consent by mail. And uh, sample from home, yes, you never know whose sample has been substituted. Posthumous use of gametes is very interesting because uh, suddenly the family may think that you know the property is being lost. Uh, young grown up son is gone and uh, they may say use his sperms and make a baby for us. But then unless the person has given a consent earlier, yeah. the couple has given a consent earlier, you cannot use the dead person's gametes. The consent has to be there even before the person dies. That's very clear. But now, again, okay, just okay, to… Okay, Asha, how can a sudden heart attack, how will you get a signature? You give my sperm. No, the, when you collect the gametes, you take the consent. Yes, that, the, the consent the has to be… you how to take the yeah. consent. Yeah. So, so I think the consent for collection of Today gametes you see, is… You there in ICMR booklet. Yeah, exactly. book is there, but yeah, in case uh, there's a demise, I'm practically, <coughs> practically anybody say, you please sign when you are dying, we'll take the sperm. How? <laughs> <laughs> that fellow will fail. <laughs> No, 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 that's <laughs> negative thoughts for them. No, 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 no. You have to take the sperm when he's healthy and assume that he will die at some point. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that, is the, that is the way law works, unfortunately. Uh, yes, the, yeah. But in the newer consent forms, when you are uh, freezing the embryos, there is a column there, isn't it? Whether, what they want to do with the embryos, if yeah. one yeah. of the… So, yeah. according to yeah. the newer guidelines, I think, I mean, it is yeah. harsh talking to them when you're doing a fertility treatment, one of you is going to be not there. And yeah. what do you do with the embryos? I do ask this question. And whenever I do any kind of a consent, um, I mean, I do a video consenting. Because sometimes the papers could be lost. Absolutely. And uh, the video consenting is in my PC and I record it. And after like, you know, 10 or 20 consents has been done, I transfer it to a hard disk. I mean, this was all taught by um, one of our uh, embryologists, uh, Mr. Jones. He's uh, not already, there. Already people are coming with so much stress and pain, you know, when they yeah. come to hospital, they never, they had so many people they are not able to take the correct sperm. If you say, you give the sample, suppose if you die, we lose it, <laughs> then that one is gone. Then Madam, they, you tell them that <laughs> after yeah, they so give the sample. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you do all that. <laughs> after they give the sample, you get the concern, so that they are not anyway, panicked. Anyway, <laughs> okay, so I think, I think the oh, essence… Oh, I think can't masturbate and I, I think I the essence you. of this is that you should have a comprehensive consent. But you have to save your skin at one point, madam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be standing in the court of law for all of Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's why I think consents have to be very comprehensive and we have to start looking beyond normal consents uh, that we are used to taking, like I'm taking your sample and freezing it. We need to start having more comprehensive consents. Dr. Vani, let me come back to you. You have put a patient for pickup. Now you put in the probe, anesthesia has been given and you see that there's a lot of free fluid uh, over there. How will you troubleshoot that case? Yeah, it's, it's a sad state of affairs, but uh, uh, we have, like um, everybody said already, we are extremely paranoid when somebody is on stimulation, uh, especially for this. 
whether they will rupture and uh, there are a few scenarios where they might rupture early and uh, uh, poor responders and elderly people and just have one or two follicles and um, after they rupture, troubleshooting when you suspect is we can give indomethacin and uh, uh, you know we can prevent, we won't know whether they'll rupture yeah. but if we give indomethacin probably we'll, they won't rupture and then we can have a peaceful night's sleep. But if, uh, once we are in that situation, uh, many a times, I, I read in the literature and I've done myself also, if we can go ahead and uh, aspirate those follicles, few of them will have, will have eggs. Ab absolutely. So at least 50%, uh, according to literature, 50% we get. Even though we didn't get 50%, but we don't leave it, we'll get at least two or three and we get at least one blast out of it and so that we can save our face and have sure. a transport. And also aspirating the free fluid. Free, free fluid also. Whatever free fluid you see, if you aspirate yeah. it, you're likely to get maybe not all, but at least uh, a few yeah. follicles. But yeah. in my own experience, um, the aspirating the follicles, they, even though they look as if they've completely ruptured, they give better uh, eggs yeah. than free fluid. Absolutely. Somehow they Absolutely. get lost or whatever, I don't yeah. know. Absolutely. Even though Absolutely. theoretically we can aspirate yeah. So the I think fluid. you have to do both. Just because yeah. you see a lot yeah, of free yeah. fluid doesn't yeah, mean you not? should yeah. remove the probe and say I'm sorry. Yeah. You go ahead, you still <laughs> do aspirate follicles, you still aspirate free fluid and there is a good chance that you'll get something. Dr. Yeah. Danbagi ma'am, uh, you are doing the pickup and you have put the needle in but you're not getting fluid yeah, after yeah. puncturing. Uh, this thing suction pump, you know, if you check the suction pump, before yeah. so we start, we'll check whether yeah. the pressure is correct or not. So if it is uh, low pressure or the this tube is crackled. The tube is, is cracked. cracked, I think most of the yes. times when and I've seen this. And the needle yeah. is blocked. All yeah. these things we all met every day. Yes. So all these things you have to check properly and before starting. Yes. And, and media, please aspirate the media just little before putting the needle into your uh, Okay, another question. How often do you have to chain the needle? in these situations. Do you ever change the needle or will no. you do the flushing etc. and then things just start working? No, 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 no. Always the same needle but same flush, needle. It, flush it, blood clot is there, flush right. it and, and usually initially it's not coming there. Then you check everything, then once you start it will be doing Absolutely. Right? So no, I think it's no important to, to realize Unless that don't be in a hurry to change the needle because needles are expensive and mm -hmm. everything adds to the cost. So now try to do everything. Sup suppose something, some chocolate says yeah. in the middle, something entrance is there. Some, sometime I had one patient with OD patient, pus was coming in another follicle or something. It was like My a God. pus. Okay. <laughs> I felt so bad. Then immediately uh, we removed the needle. Some, yeah. exp some uh, sort of uh, time we have to yeah. change the needle. The sort of ex except yeah. fluid, <laughs> whatever you are <coughs> obtaining, except follicular fluid, whatever you sure. see, you change the needle. Absolutely. Yes. So don't panic if there's no fluid. Check the tube, check the suction, check the tube, suction tubing and if nothing works, you know sometimes it has happened particularly when uh, there are new centers, they don't clean no? the inside yes. of the biopsy guide. Yes. So everything is working well and then when you pass the needle through the biopsy guide, there is some gunk in that biopsy guide yes. which goes into the needle. Yes. So that's also a good idea that you check the, yes. put the needle in the biopsy guide outside before you start the pickup. Yes. And that way you'll be sure that there is nothing in the biopsy guide which gets stuck to the tip of the needle. Always so. you should have a <coughs> standby, another yeah. suction machine, Yes. always ultrasound machine, yes. everything, anything will go off. So Absolutely. everything you should have two, two in each center, each uh, theater. Sure. Uh, Dr. Uma, no oocytes retrieved after aspirating a few follicles. I think that's a nightmare scenario we don't <laughs> want to face, <laughs> empty follicle syndrome. But before coming to that conclusion, just a few points what we need to check is like whether the HCG was given on time or the trigger was given on time and are we doing it uh, after 34 or 36 hours. That's one of the first things we check. And if the patient is being anesthetized and if you can't confirm that, what I generally do is take a urine sample and do a beta HCG, the pregnancy test. So yeah. that, that shows that the HCG is bigger, been given. And now as uh, uh, Dr. Asharao said, we are getting paranoid. <laughs> and for those uh, women, we think they might be a little bit uh, not sure when they, they take the injections uh, at the right time. We try and do um, HCG, beta HCG levels the day before so that we know that they have taken it. That's one of the Next things moment, we uh, use. when you say no X, no, madam, you said ultrasound, lo lovely X, everything is grown well, you are very good. Yeah. Now you say no X, yeah. what is this madam, what is this? Oh, you people are telling lies, huh? you will bastard you, this patient, no, really. Yesterday I had a patient, she had a, uh, uh, this one, no, uh, unification surgery by one of our units in Chennai only. She didn't conceive three-time implantation failure, I did all nonsense, but she still, she, she was three hours, she didn't leave me. 
She was going on telling, okay, I'll do free IVF, please leave me. Then only she left. Okay, then only she left. <laughs> yes, it is a difficult situation because every time you've done the sonography, you told the patient, I can see so many follicles and so on and so forth. And then suddenly when you do the pickup, you know, there are no eggs. So Would you ever, uh, you know, in this case, you, you started doing the pickup, you've done, let's say, um, 10, you removed 5 from one side. Now you've done a UPT and that UPT is negative. Yeah, I would uh, repeat the trigger and then uh, sort of bring her back after 34, uh, 36 hours. Yeah. For at least one ovary we would get some and explain to the patient. And whenever I say about this follicles and eggs, uh, when I get my concern, I kind of make it very clear to them. It is the follicles yeah. which we can see through scan. And in it, you may have an egg or you may not, not have an egg. egg. Yeah, I so. make it very clear to them and uh, I ask them to write it down in their regional language and get a concern done. This is one of the things which I follow. Yes. Sure. Another thing, always the pre uh, 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 pre uh, pre uh, PMF people, not like... Uh, uh, poor reserve, everything, poor reserve people and all, no, always they'll get, they will have no eggs. Then always in a problem, no? Why did you simulate? Lot of questions, no? If you clinically, you meet each and every person, uh, troubleshooting failure and no eggs, no fertilization, uh, your uh, level of uh, uh, failure in the cleavage level. The embryo is brown oocyte, zona, thick zona, yeah, brown yeah, oocyte. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They always <laughs> sight everywhere, <laughs> right? Then you have to meet everything, okay? Yeah. The failing patient counseling is very bad in our scenario. Sure. Dr. Nirmala, very poor quality of oocytes, just like, just you know, a nice segue into this, or a very low M2 percentage at, at pickup. Uh, what's the troubleshooting over here? Yeah, so what's happened is happened. And um, so I would have to uh, use the post down criteria to plan the next cycle and see what can be corrected is corrected. Sure. So. But suppose everything is great. You know, she's not got cox, uh, her AMH is okay, AFC yeah. is okay. If you do E2s, your E2 yeah, is so fine. Yeah, so her she's AFC not, is fine and AMH yeah. is fine, then she falls into category 1 and 2. So I would start with the RFSH instead of HMG at a higher dose than so what Suppose you've given with. RFSH. <laughs> you can add LH, next cycle, recombinant. Yeah, recombinant cycle. LH and a bit of androgen, a touch of androgen. Okay, gel. so let me address the question another way. Okay, uh, you've done you everything had, You have a patient like that. Okay. At what point will you advise them egg donation? At what point, sorry? I mean, at what point will you say that your oocytes, although everything seems okay, yeah. your oocytes aren't really that great. They are unlikely to produce a pregnancy and now go for egg donation. Mm -hmm. How many egg cycles donation. will you do before you say that? Personally, I would do two. Two. Okay. Anybody wants to differ or everybody agrees? I mean, like counseling the patient, if they don't yeah. want to go for their own eggs the next time, if they're financially not that very sound, I mean, give them the option. And then they make a decision rather than you going like, you know, after two cycles or three cycles. Let the patient be the decision maker. Yeah. So it kind of you takes the stress out a little bit out of you. you no, but at some know. point you have to advise the patient also, no? Yes. So after one cycle, will you tell the patient yeah, or give the option or after two cycles? Sir, so I think I agree. Yeah, you can yeah. do three to yeah. four cycles. Yeah. Because even a patient PCOS, you know, they can act very differently in every cycle. Because once you feel that you give too much dosage, and her E2 is going up, you get worried 4,000, 5,000 E2. You pick up at uh, a certain stage when you got only two M2 sites and others are all immature. Yes. Because you're worried and it was, it could have been an agony cycle where you got worried and gave the trigger early. Yeah. But next time maybe you can do an antagonist. Be careful in starting a slightly lower dosage. And then you adequate, <coughs> see that you have adequate number of mature follicles and then give the trigger and you have enough numbers. And one patient who has had two or three failures elsewhere, she told me, ma'am, you give me something low dose where I get only less number of, because she kept thinking that too many follicles, less mature follicles, you know, her cycles were uh, lost in some other center. So this time she got only three oocytes, two embryos, two embryos was transferred and she conceived. So another so thing, whenever… Helps. Patience and perseverance, yes. if the patient is young and has got enough ovarian reserve. Yeah, whenever yeah. you… Patient has less ovarian reserve, the story could Yeah, you are right. equality bad, this and that, every, immediately you say egg donation, the patient will walk to next clinic. Yeah. <laughs> Please, don't do that. Yeah. You, you will make them spend for five times. Yeah, of course, it will always… IVF says, yeah. auto correction can happen, next yeah. time or next yeah. time or next Sometimes time. Sometimes even the mild simulation the rest, can help. Then you, you say, according to our IVF law, five times you can use your gametes. It's still, it's not worth… Then you go for it. Then yeah. only she'll accept. Okay. Otherwise, okay. you will lose your patient. Yeah. You'll have to leave, Dr. Asha. Yeah. Okay. Next, uh, Dr. Madhubala, severe pain after an egg pickup. Uh, and I think there are two different situations here. 
there's one where immediately after the pickup let's say within 3 4 hours she has severe pain or she has severe pain after let's say around 4 5 days uh, how will you troubleshoot this situation? Yeah, uh, any pain like mild pain, bloating can be there for uh, ovum pickup. But when there is a severe pain, we should always think of a hematoma by uh, accidentally puncturing a blood vessel or uh, after a few days, it can be due to OHSS and we have to tackle accordingly. Yeah. What about torsion? Have you seen torsion, yeah, torsion uh, after uh, pickups? Mm. We have seen sometimes ovarian rupture and you know, a lot of uh, clots in the abdomen. When the lady came after four yeah. days with pain, oh. she had already ruptured the ovary and then we were going for a laparoscopy and clear it. Yeah. And another patient, we did the pickup in the morning at 11 o'clock. She has gone home at 4 o'clock. She had a little bit of vomiting when she went. They said, okay, take MSET, you'll be fine. And night 11.30, I was doing my PPT there in the hospital. I was in the PowerPoints and she comes with severe pain. And my doctors have seen her and given her a painkiller. And she was fine. And next morning I saw, you know, in fact that e night the finding was that the patient was not even willing to stretch. So just like this. And next morning we did the ultrasound and the abdomen was flooded with hemorrhagic fluid. Yeah. So and, we are, we are and it was not a rupture of the, uh, no, it was not a, uh, it's interesting. Uh, then we did a test, we gave her a blood transfusion, she settled beautifully. Then the hematologist said after two weeks you do her all the tests. And she came as a factor A deficiency. No, okay. yeah. so, that, so this is one of that, the rare cases, but rare it is case. very always, important. No, always post aspiration. Really because she yes. had bleeding diathesis. Post aspiration, every fourth hourly. Puncture. Yeah, you, you every fourth hourly you measure the abnormal girth. That's very important point. You for anybody you just don't don't leave it just like that. Everybody should be measured. Our staff is one staff you put for these patients and they have to measure every yeah. fourth hourly. So I think the message which essentially we want to give is that severe intractable pain. After a pickup should yeah. make you suspect Tarsion. something. Tarsion. Don't just dismiss it off as uh, normal pain after a pickup or there might be some free fluid or there might be a corpus luteum and so on. Severe and intractable pain should always be investigated uh, quite carefully. And once a patient, uh, the endometriosis came with a gradual you know, increase in pain and they turned out to be an infected uh, yeah. area. Infection is one of the things yeah. which we shouldn't yeah. forget. Okay. Abscess. And Dr. Asha Rao, abscess. bleeding PV after a pickup, uh, what do you do when the bleeding point is in the fornix? So you put a speculum, you can see, or yeah. whether the bleeding is from the Generally cervix. The tendency because, is to go and you know, apply good pressure yeah. and uh, we put a gamji and apply pressure, it generally stops. Very, very rare. We never had to do it, but they say that the people have done the suturing in the yeah. fornix, things like that. So I think uh, if I think the approach has to be slightly different if it's from the vagina it always invariably stops with pressure if it's from the cervix very 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 rarely you may have to take a stitch so I think it's important that if there's a bleeding you see where exactly it is from uh, before you decide further course of action Dr. Vani hemoperitoneum after pickup uh, how will you diagnose how will you handle the ovaries will you consider a oophorectomy uh, and will you go in laparotomy or laparoscopy? Um, hemoperitoneum, when we have to be careful when we are doing the pickup, uh, uh, we uh, means we should not lacerate and yeah. with the needle inside, not uh, roam all over the place. That is <laughs> the uh, that is the cause for hemoperitoneum. So as long as we are uh, we are sure, very careful with the needle. We don't fa we don't have to face this. But if we have to face this, then I'll go in with a laparoscopy and. Uh, um, uh, try to manage the situation and uh, uh, many a times uh, if we just uh, uh, you know do a conservative management also never Most means we, I, we, I didn't have to do a laparoscopy but I, I am assuming that we can just do a conservative management and then we can save everything I don't think we need to remove everything. so normally you wouldn't think of removing the ovaries you would also not like to handle the ovaries too much uh, and please, for God's sake, don't take sutures on the ovary. That's probably the worst time to take sutures on the ovary. Your sutures simply will not hold. They will just cut through and you will just provoke more bleeding. So if any you want to handle the ovaries, uh, do it with pressure, do it kindly, do it gently. Yeah. Otherwise, the patient won't have any ovaries left for the next time. Yeah, uh, one patient with hemoperitoneum, uh, 24 hours after pickup next day, we saw that she had a small amount of echogenic fluid in the abdomen and hemoglobin had dropped from 11 grams to 8 grams. So we were cautious. But the very next day she had tachypnea, dyspnea. Then we saw that this fluid had moved into the chest. It became a hemothorax and then we had to put an intercostal drainage and drain it. 
So this is one of the rare cases. Rare case. I think yes, this you should allow me to. Yes, sir. thank you very much. It's Dr. become very thank interesting. You. I would <laughs> like to leave. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ready for this uh, opportunity. It's a case of PCO, Asha, because uh, hemothorax. Uh, I had a bloody hemothorax for a PCO patient. Same way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me. Yeah. Let me move on, Dr. Ranbagam. Ovaries yeah. are not accessible for a TVS pickup. Will you yeah. prefer to do a laparoscopic pickup or no, an no. abdominal? No, no. Trans abdominal is very. Trans abdominal, easy. Yeah. not very difficult. So yeah. Lot of cases, trans abdominal with a, uh, uh, a trans vaginal needle itself. Always put a. Yes, absolutely. Uh, always aspirate. Uh, how what what will you give anesthesia? Proper anesthesia. You ask anesthetist to press down. And just little tilt this side, that side, it will come down for your aspiration. Okay. Very bad cases like uh, uh, this one, um, uh, uh, this uh, uterus, uh, what is that syndrome? RKH uh, yeah. or something. Yeah, 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 that is only abdominal. It was yeah. chicken to abdominal, there only. Uh, yeah. well, so like first of all, ovaries not being problem. accessible for TVS pickup is extremely rare. Yes. Although one may think that it might not be, uh, given the kind of cases we deal with, the fact is that it's extraordinarily rare. And when uh, you need to do it, you can manage by doing an abdominal. Uh, Dr. Uma, donor does not respond or there are no eggs retrieved from a donor. And the, I'm, I'm deliberately asking this question and I, I also want to know from you, uh, what do you do about the payment to the donor? <laughs> I mean, the donor has come. Um, I really feel sorry for the donors because uh, it's like an organ donation. They are coming and doing it. And what happens is that they kind of lie to you most of the times. Yeah. Like if they come through an agency and they would say, like, I've never ever given uh, egg donation in my life. The patient, the, the body language of the patient would tell you how many times you would have donated. Because uh, when you ask them to lie down for the first time, if they're ready and lying down for a transplant, vaginal scan you know that this patient is de this donor has definitely donated a few times and she knows what is uh, going to happen <laughs> I mean <laughs> how much ever cautious you are still that scenario does happen if the if there are no eggs but from the donor when you pick up if the stimulation has been good then uh, she has gone through the whole protocol you can't you have to change your donor yeah. but when you after a few days if you know that if you know that the response is not good then I would stop at that point rather than continuing with the donor yeah. I mean payment wise like you have to lose it from your side many a times it is that uh, they are on pills for a long time and uh, the trigger should be more effective dual and uh, increase the trigger that uh, works many a times and sure. then uh, even though they look, uh, the AFC looks good, they still require a uh, lot of uh, gonadotrophins because the ovaries have been punctured a lot of times. Sure. Okay, I think uh, we don't really have enough time now to cover the questions. We've got only a minute left. So I'm going to call this uh, panel to a close. I'm sure everybody is also waiting for lunch. Uh, and, uh, you know, whenever some problem occurs in the IVF lab, you always get very worried. And as this says in Shivaji, as Rajni tells uh, Adi, uh, the actor Suvan, that Pera Katale Chuma Adirudu Lado. And of course, there is always this issue of uh, stakeholders in IVF. There is a chain of custody, but there's also a blame chain. And I think this chain really needs to be broken. Uh, this is not uh, something where we should be looking to necessarily blame individuals and human error. In fact, uh, there are some who say that human error is not usually identified as the root cause. There are so many other causes. So, uh, in the last uh, 27 seconds, let me end by again thanking the smart team, thanking Dr. Sanjeeva Reddy and his entire team and all the panelists for a fantastic uh, input. Uh, if there are any questions from the audience, I won't keep the audience in the hall any longer, but I'll request them to please beat the panelists once they come down and have your doubts solved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you so much, Jaydeep. You did it so lively. Everybody, <laughs> see, not going for lunch and listening. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, it sir. It was Thank hard you. for me also not to go for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Ready, sir, to give an opportunity for all of us to be on the panel. Thank you so much, sir.